Hey y'all, it's Brittany and welcome back to another episode of Snapped in Skincare, also known as Clean Skin, Dirty Deeds. So this week we are talking all about Miss Diane Zamora and all the shenanigans that her and her little boyfriend went through in their short time together. And it's a mess, y'all. So sit back, get your skincare, and relax, unwind with me, and let's talk about Miss Diane Zamora. Now, before we kick off this story, I just wanted to thank everyone who's already subscribed. I see y'all, I appreciate y'all, I feel the love. For those of you who have been around for a little while and haven't subscribed yet, or if you're just finding my channel, hey sis, hey sir, make sure you subscribe. You don't want to miss all of the great content that I have for you guys. Not only do I do skincare and true crime, I also do a little bit of makeup, a little wine and true crime. You know, I like to relax, clearly. But you don't want to miss what I have coming for y'all. Also, make sure you like the video. Make sure you comment in those comments down below. But Let's get into it, y'all. All right, y'all. So Diane Zamora was born on January 21st, which is actually my husband's birthday. She was born on January 21st of 1978, and she was the oldest of four siblings. Now, her and her family lived with her grandparents, and it was because it was really a struggle for them to get by. Her mom was a very hard worker and she worked multiple jobs. Her dad, on the other hand, had an extremely difficult time keeping a job. So the breadwinning was mostly placed on her mom. So it was just really tough for them. But this really drove Diane. So at around nine, she decided that she wanted to become an astronaut. So she did what she needed to do. She, you know, made a list, checked it twice. She got straight A's in school. She got the work experience that she thought was required to become an astronaut. And she had a plan in place for her future. Now, as a teen, Diane's father began to have affairs on her mother and it really just tore her apart. Not to mention the effect that it had on the rest of her family and her mother as well. You know, her mom was this hard worker trying to support all of them, making sure everybody has what they need, including her own husband. And he goes and has multiple affairs on her mom. And this really made Diane vow to herself that she would never allow something like that to happen to her in any type of situation like that. So at that point, she vowed that she would not get into relationships. She would focus on her goals and she had no time for the boys. So she was going to do what she needed to do to become an astronaut like she originally planned. So she made this plan and she was going to join the Civil Air Patrol, which is kind of like the ROTC, but for the Air Force. And then her ultimate goal was to actually get into the Naval Academy in Annapolis. And I'm assuming they had some type of program that kind of helped you attain the skills that you needed to become an astronaut because that was her stepping stone to getting into an astronaut training program. This was where she met David Graham, which was around August of 1995 in this Civil Air Patrol. Now, David himself was this very smart, super athletic, super driven kid who had joined the ROTC and become a commander in the ROTC. And he had his own dreams of becoming a fighter pilot and joining the Air Force. And he, you know, wanted to go to the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. So this was two driven people who were very attracted to each other and sparks flew. So they dated for a few weeks and, you know, there was talks about intimacy and that kind of thing. And Diane was very clear with David that she did not plan on losing her virginity until she was a married woman. So six weeks after she told him that, he proposed to her and they became engaged. Now we know these two were planners, so this engagement did not come without a plan. They were planning on getting married five years from when they got engaged because they wanted to make sure that they both achieved the goals that they had set for themselves and they didn't want anything to slow them down 
or get in the way of either one of their goals. Now, also, Diane decided that hmm, being engaged is close enough to being married, right? So she eventually lost her virginity to David. And from that point on, they were completely inseparable. That is until the summer ended. Because when the summer ended, they both had to go back to their separate towns and their separate high schools to finish out their high school careers. And their high schools were about 18 miles apart. So not super far apart, but definitely not close enough for a teenage romance. On December 4th of 1995, at about 7.30 in the morning, there was a ranch owner who was getting into his car in the driveway and he noticed in his barbed wire there was a clump of hair. So he kind of went to go investigate and see where it came from. And as he went to go look closer to the fence, he found the body of a young girl and he immediately notified authorities. And upon police arrival, they went and checked the girl out. And unfortunately she was pronounced dead on arrival. And you know, there was nothing that they could do to save her, unfortunately. And they noticed that she had been shot twice in the head, once was in between the eyes. So this was done execution style. And she seemed to be, you know, pretty young. She looked like she was around 16 years old. And they knew that she was in high school because she had on a t-shirt that was from a nearby high school's track meet. So it only took police about an hour to identify who this girl was. And her name was Adrian Jones. And she was a high school student. And her parents had actually just reported her as missing. She was 16 years old. Now, police immediately went to go talk to Adrian's family and they told the police straight up, you know, she's not gotten in any real trouble. She's generally a good girl. She has snuck out of her room a few times, but, you know, teenagers do what teenagers do. And her brother had mentioned to police that he had noticed that she had actually snuck out of her bedroom window the night before to go meet someone, but he didn't have any idea who it was that she was going to meet. So police went to Mansfield High School, which was Adrian's high school, to talk to some of her friends and people that knew her to see if they could gather any more information that would help them solve Adrian's case. And kids and friends told police that there was actually this kid who was like infatuated with Adrian and he would stalk her basically, but he wouldn't even go up to her job and just sit and stare at her her entire shift while she was working. And the night that she had actually disappeared, he had called her. And she didn't appreciate any of this. They all thought it was creepy. They thought the kid was creepy. And he was actually a 17 year old prior student that had recently dropped out of high school. So bad vibes all around from this kid. Now, police immediately jump on this tip and they bring this kid in for questioning. And he basically says like, I was intoxicated. I was on medication and drunk. I don't remember what I did. I can't help you. So of course his parents were present there as well. And police asked if he would take a lie detector test. His parents instantly said no, instantly. And I don't care how police take it when you say no, you have the right to say no. It doesn't mean that you don't wanna cooperate with them, but you have the right to say no because a polygraph is not admissible in court in any way, if it's not trusted by the court, I'm not going to let you put me through that test and you make your own judgment based on it when it's not supported. But of course, police instantly see it as, oh, he's no longer cooperating with us. No, he's just not cooperating the way you want him to cooperate. But he's done everything else and answered all your other questions. Either way, they instantly get a search warrant for this kid's home, truck, all of that. And they arrest him while they, they're doing this search and they find absolutely nothing tying this kid to Adrian's disappearance and murder. And the DA asked him again because they didn't find anything, would he take a lie detector test? This time the parents were like, you know what? Fine, we believe our son. If you want him to take a test, he'll take the test. This boy passed with flying colors and instantly released after that. Now, on August 29th of 1996, police get a phone call 
from the Naval Academy. There is a Naval Academy officer who is trying to get in contact with police in the homicide department. And he wants to know if they have any unsolved case involving a teenager. And when the police say, as a matter of fact, we do, the Naval Academy officer has some tea for them. He says that he has two cadets, two female cadets in his office that are very disturbed because they have a roommate who has been telling them these stories and bragging to them that she has a boyfriend that loves her enough that he killed for her. This roommate is Diane Zamora. Now, this girl wasn't even on police's radar, but they go to the Naval Academy and they want to go and they want to talk directly to Diane. Now, when she talks to them in the beginning of September, when they fly out to the Naval Academy, she tells them, oh, you know, I was just messing around, making up stories, goofing around with my roommates. Ha ha ha. It was a joke. I wasn't serious. And she said, you know, but I do have a boyfriend because, you know, she had to tell them that she did actually have a boyfriend that was in the Air Force Academy named David Graham. But he, you know, he didn't have anything to do with anything. Now, the Naval Academy suspended Diane as soon as the police left the premises. But instead of Diane going home, she decides that it's probably best for her to just fly to Colorado Springs to see David. But... Police also followed Diane to Colorado Springs to see David. And when they get there, Diane had already come and left. So they couldn't catch up with her, but they caught up with David. Now, when they first talked to him, he said, you know, she flew straight out here instead of going home because she was so upset that she got suspended, blah, blah, blah. And that she made up that story. He has no idea why she would make up that story or say anything like that. He was stumped. He was clueless. Y'all, police were not buying that whatsoever. Not at all. So what they do is they bring in David's commanding officer and they have his commanding officer have a little chat with him to see if they can get him inspired to share more details on what actually happened. And it works. He comes around and he says, you know, I can't say it, but I'll type it all out. Now, he sat in that room and he typed for an hour and a half. And he started off about, you know, him and Diane's wild romance and how they fell head over heels for each other. But then there was this moment of betrayal in their relationship. And what he had to say was that he and Adrian were both on the track team for their high school. They went to high school together. And she had asked him for a ride from one of the track meets one day. And instead of going straight home, dropping her off, they supposedly stopped behind an elementary school and had sex and went their separate ways. Now, he said he held this in and kept it from Diane for about a month, but then he couldn't hold it anymore. He felt so bad. So he felt like he had to tell her what happened. Now, when he broke the news to Diane, she didn't break up with him. She said, the only way to make this right was you have to get rid of her. You have to kill her. That is the only way to make this right and to prove that you actually love me and only me. Kids be crazy. And even crazier, he agreed. Now, they plotted and came up with this plan that David was going to lure her out, you know, tweet talk her and get her to come out late at night with him at about like midnight or so, sneak out. And Diane was going to hide in the trunk or in the back of the car. And what David was supposed to do was he was supposed to drive out to this secluded rural area and he was supposed to break her neck. And the final piece of their plan was that they were supposed to weigh her down in the river so that no one would ever find her. So one night around midnight, David got Adrian to sneak out and come with him. They went to a rural secluded area like they planned. He got her to get out of the car with him. 
And he leaned in like he was trying to kiss her. And he started to strangle her, basically. And he said that it wasn't as easy as it looked in the movies and on TV. It was really, really hard to actually break her neck. And he couldn't do it. Now, because it was so hard for him to do what they planned to do, Adrian started to fight back. Of course, I would have fought back too. And when Diane, who was hiding in the back seat, when she saw that Adrian was fighting back and she was, you know, fighting for her life to get away from David, she hops out. And before she hopped out of the car, there were like free weights in the back seat. So she grabbed one of the weights, one of the dumbbells, and hit Adrian with it. And when she did that, she stumbled backwards. And that's how she got caught in the barbed wire fence. Now, supposedly this was the point where Diane told David to finish Adrian, and this is where he ended up shooting her twice in the head. Now, after they read this typed out confession, obviously he was arrested, but they also immediately arrested Diane. And this time when they talked to Diane, she admitted that yes, she told David that this is what had to be done. And she said it was because of the way she grew up and watching her father cheat on her mom repeatedly. And she had promised herself that she would never allow anything like that to happen to her. So the girl had to go. So at this point, both Diane and David are charged with capital murder, premeditated murder. Getting into the trial. So prosecutors basically said that Diane was the mastermind of this entire plan. And in her planner, she had actually circled the day that Adrian actually died. Her defense claimed, on the other hand, that she was just, you know, a love struck, blinded teenager who was forced to do something that she didn't want to do, forced to be a part of something by a bigger, stronger male being David. And when Diane testified, she also said that David made her do it. But the jury didn't buy any of that. They convicted her of capital murder for the murder of Adrian Jones. And she was facing a death penalty. By the grace of God, though, Adrian's mother was the one who actually asked for mercy on behalf of Diane. I don't know that I could do that. But she did. She's a bigger woman than me. So Diane actually ended up getting life in prison. Now, six months later is when David's trial actually began. Now, his defense argued that David's confession, it was a false confession, and he had just given that confession to protect Diane, and it was all Diane who actually attacked Adrian, and he wasn't even there at all. And when she attacked Adrian and told him about it, he decided that he was going to confess to cover it up to protect her, which didn't make any sense because there's no way that she would have known who Adrian was. And there's no way that Adrian would have come out to meet her at midnight, not knowing her. But it turns out that David was actually lying about something. It wasn't being there, but he was actually lying about even having sex at all with Adrian. This is what started the whole mess in the first place. Prosecutor said that it never actually happened and he actually just made it up to make Diane mad. And there was witnesses, Adrian's friends, that testified that he never, David never drove her anywhere that night. He had never given her a ride home. So ultimately, David was also found guilty of capital murder and he was also sentenced to life in prison. Now, once they were, you know, tucked away in prison, David did say, yes, yes, I did. I did kill Adrian, but I only did it because Diane told me I had to. And Diane was still singing the same song of, nope, didn't have anything to do with it. I was not a willing participant in this plan whatsoever. And things fell apart between them. They did not keep in touch with each other while in prison. So obviously they're not married. They're no longer together. And Diane actually ended up marrying another inmate in 2003. And they actually divorced in 2010. 
Now, both Diane and David will be up for parole in 2053. So their life sentences were with the possibility of parole. I just don't know about some of these kids, y'all. I just don't know. That is the story of Diane Zamora and this crazy teenager love thing, do anything for love, prove that you love me, a whole bunch of BS because I'll be damned if my child ever pulls anything like that or is ever in a relationship where that is happening, where you need to prove that you love somebody. Stop it. I just wanted to share with you guys a couple of things on the skincare piece today. Obviously today was a nighttime skincare routine and I have been outside doing yard work all day. So I was sweating balls. So I just felt nasty, yucky. So I took a very long shower and I love to take hot steaming showers because it really helps to open up my pores so that my skin better absorbs my skincare after taking a shower. So that's what I did today. And I really wanted to clean all my pores and get all the sebum and the yucky dirt and grime and pollutants out of my skin today. So that was the goal. So the first thing that I did was I used my Dr. Brandt Pore Purifying Cleanser. And this has salicylic acid, tea tree oil, and white willow bark. So I just felt like my skin really needed some salicylic acid to really clean, really help with any texture that I would get. I typically use my Dermalogica Special Cleansing Gel, um, but this, I just felt like today I needed a little bit stronger of a cleanser. So I chose this one today. I love this cleanser. It's very gentle, so I don't get any irritation from it, but it has what I need to kind of clean those pores really deep every once in a while. And because I used a stronger cleanser and also my daily exfoliant from Dermalogica, I went with a more soothing mask. So I actually used a sheet mask this week and it is the Pearlies brand. And this is their Blue Lotus and Seaweed Treatment Sheet Mask. And it's intensely moisturizing, soothing, and balancing, which again, I just felt like I need a lot of moisture and some soothing on my skin. I've had some breakouts recently, so I'm trying to get all that stuff back under control. So I just really felt like my skin needed some soothing. So I went with that. One more thing that I did add to the nighttime routine, y'all know I am a sucker for Tatcha. I love all of their products especially the ones geared towards my oily skin. But this is their new Tatcha Indigo Night Repair Cream. And I really love this cream. It's very lightweight, but it's, it's, it has enough weight. It's thick enough, but it doesn't make my skin feel greasy, oily. It just feels super moisturized, super hydrated. And this is also a serum in cream. So it has the Japanese Indigo Serum as well. I just love this product. I've been using it for about a week so far and I'm obsessed with it already. I can tell that um, when I wake up, my skin just feels more hydrated, more awake, more smooth from using this as my overnight hydrator, moisturizer, and like an overnight mask. So I'm in love with this overnight repair from Tatcha. And then I thought it would be a good idea to show you guys some other things that I use for self-care after I finish my skincare routine. I like to, you know, throw on a fragrance at night before I go to bed, just so I'm smelling good. I'm already smelling good and clean because I've been out to shower. I'm using some amazing skincare, but I love to throw on a fragrance, a more subtle fragrance that's not so in your face that I can get in bed with my husband and he won't be offended from. But tonight what I used was the Prada. This is the Prada Candy Night Fragrance. And this is so good, y'all. It is a sweet smelling fragrance and it's sweet enough for summer and spring warmer months, but it's also deep and intense enough for fall as well. It has hints of like chocolate in it. It smells so good, so good. And this is the one that I chose to put on tonight. 
But let me know in the comments down below if you guys have heard of this story before. I've heard of this story outside of Snapped, just being in the true crime world and hearing all these crazy stories. And I just think we just gotta do better. We gotta teach our kids better, make better decisions. Don't be so easily influenced to do things that you know you ain't supposed to be doing. But let me know in the comments down below what y'all think about this story this week. Interested to hear. Also, I left the links to all of the skincare that I'm using in the video. I know a lot of you have been asking from my spa headbands and things like that, I where I get them from. So I put the links to everything down in the description box below. So make sure to check that out. But otherwise, y'all, it's been so fun. It's been real. Until next time. Love you guys. Bye.